But then again, Moodle's not the vulnerable one, yeah. per se. Yeah, Moodle itself is actually vulnerable because I'm also using the same certificate as the rest of the Lost Wheels website. So that's the problem. All right, so I'm switching here and talk about CISV 310. We'll start with the homework assignment. And we'll start with the first question is, have you guys gotten started? <laughs> That's a good question. I meticulously expanded everything. Okay, very good. Okay, that is a very good thing to do, okay? You expanded everything on paper, right? I'm assuming you're doing everything on paper. Okay, so that's really a good first step. Okay, you expand all the bytes. You come up with a memory layout on paper first. So did you get a chance to go into GDB and actually look at the actual memory layout in GDB? Okay, so that would be a good next step. Okay, so the next step is to validate your understanding of memory layout. Okay, do you guys have any questions? No, okay. So the second step is to go into GDB and actually use the X command to validate your understanding of memory layout. Because there's no way to answer this question or to do this homework assignment until you understand how memory is organized in this particular program. Okay, very good. Are there any other questions? So those are good, that's a very good step to begin with. Any other questions? Okay. Any issues? I personally have not run into any yet. Okay, you haven't run into anything yet. Okay, that's a good thing. Can be a bad thing too. <laughs> if you have not attempted, then you won't run into anything. Yep. For the, uh, the last move, the move D, Okay, so you cannot change the memory address in mode. If it starts with a dollar sign, right. you have to keep the dollar sign. If it doesn't have a dollar sign, you cannot add a dollar sign. Okay. So that I think that answers your question. So you cannot change the um, memory access to an immediate operator. Any other questions? Does anyone want me to bring up the homework assignment, or do you guys kind of got a handle on this? Sure. Okay, <laughs> sure. Okay, I like that. Sure is a very reassuring word. English has a double, you know how in logic we have double negation, you know, it cancels out? But in normal colloquial, colloquial English, you have double positive, you know, meaning negative. Yeah, right. Individually, they're, you know, assertive, and you know, combined, it means negative. Right. Yeah, right. Though it could also mean positive, depending on the inflection which you're putting on it. Uh, potentially. Potentially. Yep. Okay. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the homework assignment. I think I might still have it, you know, downloaded. Let me check this. Go to downloads. Nope, it's not. Oh, it's here. Erase that part of today's note because that's the actual answer. Okay. Completely un uh, separate question, but can I borrow it before you edit? <laughs> I just have to uh, take out that one section, a few seconds. All right, so I'm going to have to download it again. Is this the right virtual machine, or weren't you running separate ones for um, the different classes? Oh, that is a good question. Okay. All right, so here's the actual program. Um, as I said a little bit earlier, the first thing you want to do is to find out exactly how the bytes are organized starting on the line with a dot byte, ending with a line of dot long. Okay, first question, how many bytes should be allocated because of these three lines? 21 bytes, okay, we talked about that on last Thursday. 21 bytes should be allocated. So now what you want to do is to just 
you know, come up with those 21 individual bytes on a piece of paper. Come up with those 21 individual bytes. And then the second thing you want to do is to look at EBX and say, well, that's the number, that's, the, that's a value in base 10. So now the question is, um, base 10 doesn't lend itself to um, chopping across your know, byte boundaries. So you have to think about, okay, how can I turn this representation into a format so that it's easier to see, oh, okay, out of this 32-bit word, or 32-bit you know, constant, these are the first eight bits, these are the second eight bits, and so on. Okay, I'm not gonna answer that question, okay, because there are multiple right answers to, to that question. The third thing you have to do is to say, okay, now that I understand these individual bytes have to go into EBX, okay? Then you think, okay, out of these bytes, how do I make sure that that part of EBX has these bytes? Which instruction can do that? And then you have to look at the ordering of the instructions because some of these instructions will overwrite certain parts of EBX. So you, you, you have to think about, okay, which instruction can overwrite which part of EBX, and then you, then you use that as a clue and say, okay, now I need to work backwards. Okay, any questions about that part, how to get started or, or how to think about this homework assignment? This doesn't really, you know, it doesn't doesn't feel like a real programming assignment, right? It doesn't feel like your CISP 360, 400, or 430 homework assignment. It is not asking you to write any code. In fact, the, the code is already written. All you have to do is to fill in three blanks to make it happen. It's, it, it feels more like what? Okay, I don't want to hear torture, but <laughs> what does it feel like? It feels like detective work. Right? Okay, it's a puzzle. You have to solve the puzzle. But in the process of solving the puzzle, you will have to understand all the concepts that we have talked about on last Thursday. Yep. All right, so um, just to be clear, because like, uh, from my understanding, uh, basically like, uh, like I'm not sure about anybody else's, but like uh, pretty much we're just grabbing the value from memory once and then the other ones we're just entering. That, that's from my understanding, but I'm not sure. Okay, well, there, okay, let's talk about the address and notes, which is basically say, okay, where are we copying to where, okay? The first instruction, I'm gonna turn on the line numbers, so this way we can re I can refer to line numbers. On line nine, the first operand, which is the first thing that we specify in the move out instruction, what is that doing? What kind of thing, you know, is acting as the source? What, are, what, what am I copying from? There are three, four possibilities, okay? We have talked about four possible uh, sources. The first one is a constant, okay? Which means that whatever we put here is a part of the instruction, and that is the bit pattern that we are copying to the second operator. That's the first option. Second option, we're specifying the source. It's a register, okay? Whatever is in a particular register, we copy that to the destination, which turns out to be another register. Third option. Whatever I specify is the address of in the memory, and the content at that address is what I'm actually copying. Fourth option, I use a register as an address, or I use the value of a register as an address, we go to that location, and then we copy the content at that location to the second operand. So out of the four options, which one are we dealing with on line nine as the first operand? The first one, constant, okay, very good. What about the next line, line 10? On line 10, the first operand, which is E, A, X in parentheses, which one of the four options are we talking about? The register E, A, X has the address. We go to that location, we copy, in this case, four bytes, because it's an L, we copy those four bytes to EBX. The content. the content at the address. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that that's what the uh, that's what line ten is specifying. What about line eleven? If you replace the underscores with something, how would that something be used? 
If you replace the underscores on line 11 with a zero, what is it going to do? Or what will it try to do? Okay, go ahead. Uh, zero is the location. Zero is the address. So we'll try to copy the content at location zero to bx. But we won't be copying a byte because this is a move w, which means how many bytes are we attempting to copy? Two, because a move w is 16 bit wide. Okay, very good. And then the last one is the same as the first one because it starts with a dollar sign. Okay. So that's one thing you have to do, you know, one thing you have to understand is how are we specifying content, okay? Is it a constant? Is a particular register storing an address, we go to that location and whatever content is at that location, we copy? Or is the first operand itself specifying an address that is you know, just a fixed location? We go to that location, we copy the content. So out of those three, because we only have three here, you have to understand how they are different and work with those. So that's the first thing. Second thing you have to remember is NDNS, okay? Which means when you have a multi-byte integer to store in memory, which byte is the first byte? Is it the most significant byte or is it the least significant byte? So that's NDNS. The Intel processor is little endian, which means the least significant byte is at the lowest address. Um, let's see, one more thing. One more thing you have to remember is the structure of EBX. EBX itself is a 32-bit register. BX is not another register. BX is a window into the first 16 of the 32-bit register. To be more exact, it is bit 0 to bit 15. So that's BX. It's just a smaller window into the same register that we understand as EBX. BX and BL, they are 8-bit windows, just like BX is a 16-bit window, but BL refers to bit 0 to bit 7, and then BX refers to bit 8 to bit 15. So those are the major concepts that you have to understand in order to get this assignment done. Are there any questions about those specific, specific concepts? No questions. Has anyone tried? Okay. And you done? Okay. Excellent. I guess my question is as long as we have that number at the end, then mm -hmm. the guarantee that we did right. Like as long as we fill in the blank. Yes. As long as you fill in the blanks and not change the addressing mode and you get to the same constant at the end, then you're good. I believe there's only one answer, there's only one way to get it done. Any other questions? Good. Uh, how did you uh, set the numbers on the side? Like what, uh, how do the I? The line numbers. numbers. Oh, the line numbers? Yeah. Uh, this is the I, so you know, the command to do is call set n u. Well, how do you how do you get that little bottom part to show like that? Oh, uh, colon. If you type colon in the I, it gets you into what we call the command mode. Then you can type actual commands in the I to do stuff. So once again, you'll type press colon, and then type set and u, and that will turn on the line numbers. If you do a colon and then say set n o n u on no number, then it will turn off the line numbers. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. So B H is the last It's 8 to bit 15, correct, of DBX. Uh, yeah. uh, 32 bit. <laughs> it's just going to get from 7 bit to 15. No, BH is just referring to bit 8 to bit 15 of EBX. EBX has 32 bits. This one is just focusing on 8 of those 32 bits. From 8 to 15, correct. Right. Any other questions? No, no questions about this one? <coughs> All right, just remember it's due on Thursday, okay? 
And what we'll also do on Thursday is a practice exam for this class for 310. So I'm spacing out uh, 440 and 310. So for those of you who are taking both classes, you won't have this, you won't have two exams on the same day and they're right next to each other. I can't really do much about the final exam, unfortunately, but at least for midterms, I can do that. I can space them out. Okay. Any other questions about the homework assignment? Yeah. Is the test next week? The test is going to be next Thursday. It's one week from the practice exam. So that will be next Thursday. All right. Questions of any kind before we move on? No questions? All right. If there are no questions, I'm going to continue with newer topics. Let's see. Oh, four people have turned it in already. Good job. All right. So we have talked about your know, subtraction and comparing. Okay. It's the same stuff that we have talked about before. Except I think this one talks about the actual instructions. Check that. Subtraction and comparison. Yep, talks about the actual instructions. And the other one talks about just one more. It talks about the add instruction. This is really old. Okay, I haven't even fixed the link yet. Um, so anyway, there are two instructions or three instructions that can do computations. The move instruction doesn't do a single thing about computation. All it really cares is you specify a number of bytes as the first operand, and I'll copy those to the destination. That's all it's going to do. It will not add, it's not going to subtract, it's not going to compare. There are other instructions that can do the actual calculations. So what we'll do today is to you know, talk about those instructions. And what I'll do is I'm going to fix my link here. That's one link that I haven't fixed. I'm still in the assignment mode, so I need to go back to here. And this is the one that I'm going to fix. I wrote multiple versions of my notes because at some point, you know, I decided, yeah, I want to rewrite, you know, how things are presented. Display, I should do it. All right. Okay, arithmetic operations, you know, this has a lot of repetition of what we have already talked about how to do binary, how to do base conversion, we talked about that. How do we add, how do we subtract, um, how do we do negation, which is two's complement. So we can talk about all of that stuff already. We talked about the four flags already too. Okay, the zero flag, the carry flag, which is also known as the borrow flag, the negative flag or the sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the result. And then we also talked about the overflow flag. So this stuff, you know, is a, is a complete overlap with what we have already talked about. And here, this is the only part that is new, okay? Common instructions that can change the status flags. The first one is called the add instruction, which is just ADD. And the add instruction, you know, is just, you know, adding the first operand to the second operand. So we'll go to the general syntax description. It's kind of here, okay? If you just focus on one instruction here, that just, that will add EAX as a register to the four bytes at location large num2. Large num2 is here. It is defined as, um, it, I reserve eight bytes for that. That's, that's what dot fill is doing, okay? All right, so what we'll do is we'll go through a few examples of using the add instruction. We are not gonna do anything tricky with memory because we just want to focus on, okay, how do we add numbers and how it, does it affect the flags and how do we know which flag is set and which one is cleared? Okay, so that's what we'll do in the next, I would say about five, 10 minutes or so. All right, so let's switch here to a text window and we'll go ahead and write some sample programs. 
And the first one, it will only explain how to do add, okay? And we'll make it an add long instruction. Dot global underscore start. Can anyone tell me again you know, what does it do on, with, with a dot global underscore start? What does it do? To export the label underscore start. Very good. Okay, because the linker needs to know where is underscore start. Why? What does it represent? The entry point, exactly. That's the entry. Yeah, that's the entry point of the entire program, and that's why underscore start is a very important label. Okay. Then we go ahead and actually you know, define it to be here. Whatever here is is up to the linker to decide. Okay, I don't even know where you know underscore start really is. It's just some memory location. So what we'll do is we are going to use the move out instruction because I want to initialize a register first with a particular value. So I don't, you know, let's not do anything too fancy. So just 46 into register EAX. And then the second instruction is the new one, which is add long instruction. It's going to add the first operand to the second operand and then store the sum in the second operand. So now I can specify another number. I can specify negative 23. And the end result I want to store in EAX. Okay. Uh, let's just say that this is this is my entire program. So by the time I get to the no op instruction, what should be the value in EAX? Sorry, twenty three because twenty because forty six plus negative twenty three is just twenty three. Okay, you can look at it. You know when you display EAX, EAX, you can display the value in base ten, base sixteen, base two, whichever base you choose to use. Or base eight. Okay, those are the main bases supported by the debugger. Okay, are there any questions about this code up to this point? What about the flags? Which one should be set? Which one should be cleared? Let's start with the Z flag. Should the Z flag be set or cleared? It should be cleared because the result is non-zero. What What about the C flag? The carry flag. Does the addition end up with a carry? That's a trick question, by the way. How is negative 23 represented? We use two's complement. Remember two's complement. So what, what is two's complement? What does it do? And then plus one, right? So when you look at when you look at 23, what is the binary bit pattern to represent the value 23? Okay, let's see if I can just add it here. Okay. So what is the binary representation of 23? Not negative 23, just 23 itself. What does it look like? It has 116. Okay, so you have 116, 1, 4, 1, 2, and 1, 1. Does it look right to you? Because it's 7 plus 16, okay? Okay, so we look at this bit pattern, and we'll just take eight bits this time. Okay, this is an eight-bit bit pattern representing the value 23. What about negative 23? What what does it look like? You apply two's complement to it, right? This is two's complement, which is basically one's complement to the same bit pattern plus one. But we already know what is one's complement. It's just uh, turning all the zeros into ones, all the ones into zeros. So we, we end up with one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero, zero. And then we have still have the plus one on the other side. So after the entire two's complement operation, we end up with one, 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 zero, one, one, oops, one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero, one. That is the binary bit pattern representing negative 23 using only eight bits. What do you think it's gonna look like in 32 bit? A lot more ones. Yep, we just pad a whole bunch of ones to the left hand side. Why? How do I know that you know we just pad a whole bunch of ones when a value can already be represented in eight bits? Yep. Like, uh, I suppose like since like uh, <coughs> Yep, so the original bit pattern, even though I only wrote down 00010111, it has an implicit infinite number of zeros 
to the left hand side because the most significant zeros are usually left out. How would that impact one's complement? All those zeros turn into ones. So that's why you know, when you want to extend the width of a number, you just have to have, you know, in this case, if it's a negative value, you just keep having ones to the left hand side. Okay? All right, so getting back to the question, what do you what will happen if you add 46 to this particular bit pattern? From the perspective of the carry flag, because we were talking about the carry flag, is it going to be set or cleared? Sorry? It's going to be set. Yep. Mm -hmm. The carry flag will be set. Next flag, the sign flag. Is the sign flag going to be set or cleared? In other words, when you look at the result after the addition, is the sign flag, which is the most significant bit of the result, is that going to be a 1 or a 0? It's going to be a 0 because it has to represent 23. Okay, And 23 is a non-negative number, which means the sign flag has to be a 0. What about the overflow flag? In other words, is the sign of the result making any sense? Or, alternatively, you can also ask, am I running out of values to represent the result of 46 plus negative 23 using 32 bit numbers? The answer is no, which means the overflow flag is going to be a zero. Okay? So now that we have you know, done some of these expectations or predictions, we'll just write it down. Okay? So we'll write down you know, what we think the end result should be. Okay? EAX should end up with the representation of 23, but we have that already. So it's going to be a whole bunch of zeros, and then we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay? That should be in EAX. If you prefer to look at this as uh, base 16, we group the bits in groups of four, but we have to do it from left to, from, excuse me, from right to left. So we, we group these four bits first, and then we say, okay, what does it look like as, a, as one single hexadecimal digit? That's seven. And then we look at the next four bits, which are these guys. It's just one, okay, so we say one. And then we look at all the other ones, they're all zeros. So we have, you know, zero, 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 four zeros, and then zero, zero, one, seven should be the hexadecimal representation of what the, the bit pattern in EAX. Okay. Next question, okay, what about all the flags? We just, you know, mentioned all the flags. So the Z flag should be a zero because the result is non-zero. Uh, the carry flag is a one because you are adding one, 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 blah, 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 to a number, and the end result is you will over, you, it, it will you know, turn the carry flag on. Uh, we said that the sign flag should be a zero because the end result is a non-negative number, and non-negative numbers has the sign flag being a zero. And then the last one is our overflow flag. The sign does make sense, so that's why the overflow flag should be a zero as well. So that's my prediction, okay? That's, I th that's what I think should happen when I execute this program, especially the add long instruction. Are we okay with this? Are there any questions related to any of these things that I said, okay, you know, when we execute this code, this should happen? So questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, can, can, you carry the, can you explain the carry flag one more time? Okay, the carry flag is really just the last carry, okay? So let's just do this one, one time here. Um, so, that, on the whiteboard. so that trailing carry from the adder, it just links straight to that particular spot? Yep, exactly. <coughs> that's, the, that's the leftover carry from the most significant digit. Okay. So we have, you know, in this case we have 46. So let's see, how, we, how do we represent 46? Now that we already know what is 23, what is the quickest way to get to 46? One string to zero is a One zero padded to which side? To the right hand side. Very good. Okay, because 46 is 23 times 2. When you multiply by 2 in base 2, you're padding zeros to the right hand side. Okay, so now we know, you know, the 46 looks like 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then the express zero here as an A bit number. 
I'm not going to do 32 bit because it's going to be quite boring. All the other bits are just all zeros or all ones. The other number, which is negative 23, we, we did the calculations already. It is 1110, and we have 1001. So we add up these two. Okay? 0 plus 1 is a 1. 1 plus 1 with no carry. There's no carry here either. So this adds up to be a 1. 1 plus 0 is a 1. 1 plus 0 is a 1. No carry. Same thing over here. No carry. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with a carry. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 1 is a 1. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with a carry. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 1 is a 1. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with a carry. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with an extra carry. Okay. So as an a, in the a bit addition, we just, valid, we just validated our prediction. Because when you look at this bit pattern here, what is it? It's our 23. Okay? And there's an extra carry here. This is our sign bit. Are we doing okay so far with this calculation? Do you vague do you guys vaguely remember all this stuff? Vaguely, okay. <coughs> Which means you know you might need to do some studying for the test. Okay. But concept wise, are there any questions you know in terms of concept? <coughs> questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and see whether this program does what we think it is supposed to do. Okay. Save it. Okay, and this is the command to Assemble, which is about the same thing as compiling, okay, because it just turns the source code into an object into object code. And then we have to link it. And then we can run the program in GDB. In GDB, L is listing the source code so that we can you know, find out which line we want to put a breakpoint on. You can always just you know, put a breakpoint on a label. In this case, I'm putting a breakpoint on the underscore start label which means as soon as we get into the program, stop, okay? I want to stop and look at the register values, which is fine. And then we run the program, and I just realized I've been using 32-bit instructions in the 64-bit environment. It does work, okay? It's okay. It's just that uh, when we do the homework, sometimes we have to use the 32-bit virtual machine. Okay, so at this point we have, um, let's check out the EAX before the first instruction. It just turns out to have to have a value of zero. Then we single step, we have just executed the first instruction. Let's double check and see what is in EAX. EAX has a value of 46, which is 2E in hexadecimal. Is that making any sense? Okay, it's, it's make, it makes sense, okay? Because we are referring to this bit pattern here, it is 2E, because this is, this is E, and that is 2. So 2e is the correct hexadecimal representation. OK. So this is not very exciting. And we'll go ahead and single step. Well, hold on a second here. Let me show you what the flags look like. Okay. The command to look at the flags is ir, i space r space e flags. The i and the r means uh, info register, tell me about the registers. E flex is a very special register. It is normally not accessible explicitly when you're programming. The debugger does have access to it so that we can see you know, what flags are set and what flags are reset. It will display you know, flags that we have not even talked about in this class. So the only thing you can do is to see whether Z, which means zero, C, which is carry, um, S, which stands for sign, and also O for overflow. If you see those in this inside the square bracket, it means it is set. If it is absent, it is zero. It's clear. Okay. So this is the initial condition. I have not executed the add instruction yet. So now we single step and look at the flags again. 
So the first thing we notice is the Calvary flag is in fact set. Okay, but none of the other flags that we are interested in is set. They're all cleared because we don't see it here in this in this inside the square brackets. Okay, that's the first thing that we verify. Second thing we want to verify is what is the EAX at this point? It is one seven in hexadecimal or twenty three in decimal. So everything went kind of as expected. Any questions? No questions? Okay. Can anyone see how the add instruction can be combined with other instructions that we have already talked about so that we can have very flexible ways of accessing memory? Okay. Where, how do we do that? Why do we have that flexibility? Because adding is computing, right? So that means I can compute the result, store it in the register, and then later on use the register as the address of the content that I'm copying from. I can do calculations on addresses. Okay. So we'll get back to that later on. Okay. Right now we are not too concerned about that. And I'm not going to ask you guys to do an uh, add with carry, you know, because it's, it's a useful instruction, you know, but we don't have enough time to do it. So we're not going to deal with add with carry. Instead, we'll move on to subtraction. Subtraction is kind of the same thing as addition, but with subtraction, you have to find out which one, which operand is subtracted from which other operand because it is not commutative. So, with subtraction, we're going to make another program just for subtraction. So we'll subtract long, and we'll go ahead and do about the same thing. We'll move a particular value into a register. Okay, this time I'll move a 5 into DAX, and then we'll do a subtraction. We'll subtract uh, 21 from 5. And then we want to know, okay, what is the result? Now, all of you know, 5 minus 21 is negative 16. Okay, so we know it's going to be negative 16 already. But the question is, how is it represented? And two, what flags are going to be set and what flags are going to be cleared? Those are the questions. Okay, so when this is all done, EAX, you know, has a... Um, signed interpretation of negative 17. The question is, what is it, how is it represented as a big pattern? How can we find out what is the binary representation of negative 17? Two's complement, very good. Okay, so we figure out what is the binary representation of 17 first, okay? And then we apply two's complement to find out what is the representation of negative 17. All right, so let's do it here. Okay, I'm just you know doing it on inside the source code, just as, a, as an exercise. 17 in base 10 is what bina what in binary? This one is a pretty easy one. It's 16 plus one. So 16 is one followed by how many zeros? And no, three zeros is a eight, four zeros. Oh, okay, so you're, you're done with the whole computation already. You're correct. Okay, this is 17 in base 2. Okay, this is 17 in base 2, but we are not interested in 17 as the result of the calculation. We want to know what is negative 17. So if we want to know what is negative 17, it is the 2's complement applied to 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 in base 2. I just want to make sure that we have a fixed width in terms of uh, representing the numbers. So we have a fixed width of eight bits in this case, plus one. And then two's complement is, <coughs> okay, it's one, oops, I take it back. The plus one does not apply here, it applies in the next row. So this is where we apply one's complement and then the plus one, and then on the 
next row, we just do the ones complement, which puts all the zeros into ones and all the zeros into all the ones into zeros. Remember to add one at the end, and then we end up with zero one 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 zero one 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 one. Okay. So you know, and then we want to look at this as a hexadecimal number because we want to you know look at it easily in the debugger. Um, one 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 zero is a E. One 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 is an F. So that means the actual representation in 32 bits is going to be F F F F F F E F because we have a whole bunch of one zero to the left hand side. Uh, we do know okay so far with figuring out the bit pattern in E A X after the subtraction. Yep. Isn't it six negative sixteen, not negative seventeen? Say again. The answer five minus twenty one wouldn't it be negative sixteen? Uh, you're right. Out of six and not negative forty two. And close enough. Okay. Instead of changing all the things that we have done already. Oops, no, no, the other direction. <laughs> Can't do arithmetic. Okay. What about the flags? Good point. The zero flag is going to be, remember, the zero flag reflects whether the result is zero or not. If it's not zero, it's going to be a, it's cleared. Okay, it's a zero. What about the carry flag? Or in this case, it's the borrow flag. What do you think? Do we end up borrowing or not? 4 minus 21 does trigger a borrow. Okay. So the borrow flag, which is also known as the carry flag, is a 1. What about the sign flag? In other words, we look at the result. The most significant bit of the result is that going to be a 1 or not? Is the result negative? Then the sign flag is going to be a one. Okay. And the last question is overflow, which is asking, do we have enough bits to represent the actual result? Do is thirty-two bit enough to represent negative seventeen? Yeah. Okay. So that means the overflow flag should be a zero. So that's the prediction. Okay. We have a zero flag being cleared. The carry flag being set, the sign flag is set, the overflow flag is clear. Okay. So we save the file, and then we and then we do the assembling. G steps. Linking. And now we can debug it. Put a breakpoint at start and let's for start. Uh, run the program, single step, you know, nothing too exciting after the first instruction. After all, EAX only has a value of four. Okay. Single step one more time. This is the subtraction instruction. And we want to take a look at EAX again, and it is FFFFFEF, representing negative 17 if you choose to use the signed interpretation. And what about the flags? I R E flags. The carry flag or borrow flag is set. The sign flag is set. Overflow flag is cleared, and the zero flag is cleared as well. Okay, so everything just happened as expected. Are there any questions about the subtract instruction or subtract subtraction instruction? Oh, I never explained which one specified. What are we subtracting? Because subtraction is not commutative. Okay? So what is the order ordering of the subtraction? Are we subtracting the first from the second or are we subtracting the second from the first? We're subtracting the first from the second. Okay, very good. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Have we used any new addressing modes? Is there a new way to specify content or numbers to be subtracted, numbers to be added? 
Nope, I haven't introduced anything new, just the new instructions to make use of the values. All right, switching back to the notes here, the next one talks about compare. C and P is compare. It is the same as a subtraction, except the difference is not stored. Okay, what does that mean? Let's go back to this terminal, and it will not type. And what we'll do is we'll take a look at the subtraction instruction, and we'll make it turn it into a compared instruction. So instead of SUB for subtract, we have CMP for compare. And the end result is identical to what we had before, except EAX is not going to be changed by the compare instruction. It will go through everything that the subtraction instruction goes through in terms of setting the flags, except it doesn't store the result into the second operand. That's the only difference between the subtract and the compare instruction. Yep, just the word ordering of numbers is bad. Would still be the same. It does. It is important. It is still subtracting 21, the, the value 21 from whatever is in EAX. So the ordering is still important because it, it, it really is the same thing as a subtract instruction. But it's only checking to see if the result is zero. Correct. And if the result is zero, then it doesn't matter which way you do it. If if zero or not is the only thing you you care about, yes. But remember, sometimes we can all, we also want to know whether it's greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, signed versus unsigned. So that's why the ordering is important. Okay. All right. So we'll do this, you know, just just so that we we have a sample program to go with it. Okay. But the only thing I have to do is here, you know, EAX is not going to be changed. EAX will remain to be four, remain as four, which in uh, hexadecimal is also four. So there's no need to go through all this stuff here. Is that okay? Because I want to document the program, you know, so that we can see what is expected out of this code. Okay. All right, so we'll do assembly, CMPL. We'll do the linking. And then we'll debug it. Single step, okay, single step one more time. First thing, check what is in EAX. It is still four, okay? We haven't changed anything in the second operand, okay? But we, when you look at the flags, I, R, E, flags, we get the same result. The borrow flag is set, the sign flag is set, but then the overflow and the zero flag are both cleared. Is that okay? Are there any questions at this point about these instructions? No questions? Is there any curiosity about these flags? Because we talk about these, okay? I define the actual Boolean definition of these flags. We now can see that several instructions, the add, subtract, and compare instructions, they can all affect these flags that we talked about already. Do they make use of these flags? They do not make use of these flags. So are there any, is there any curiosity regarding who's making use of these flags? We keep talking about these flags, but nobody seems to be using it. Right? Okay, so there are instructions that will make use of the flags. The only type of instructions that can make use of the flags are jump instructions, okay? Jump instructions are instructions that can alter the path of execution. So you can continue execution at a different spot. They're basically go-tos, but some of these go-tos are conditional go-tos, which means sometimes it will go to somewhere else, other times it will not, okay? All right, so we, in terms of the notes, I just want to go back to you the notes part here so that we know where we are. We are now, you know, in the jump instructions, which I think the link is still, oh, it is. I fixed this one, this one is working. So these are the jump instructions. The first one is called unconditional branch or uncondi unconditional jump instruction. In some really old textbook, they're also called transfer instructions. I have no idea why they call transfer instructions, but they're basically jump or go to instructions. 
All right, so we'll just go ahead and talk about this a little bit using an example. So here's an, uh, a simple program that makes use of the jump instruction. You already know about the jump instruction, even though you're not supposed to use a go-to instruction in C and C++, it serves exactly the same purpose. So I will talk about this kind of not trivial program that makes use of the jump instruction. So in this case, we have the no op instruction. No op and op really does not do anything. Okay, it is an instruction. Okay, it takes up space in memory. It is an instruction, except it doesn't do a single thing. Okay, it just chews up the you know, CPU cycles, makes your processor harder. Okay, that's the only thing it does. And then we have a second instruction. The second instruction is a unconditional branch instruction, and what it says is continue execution at the label underscore start, which is going back right to the no op instruction. And then we go to the jump instruction again, go back to the no op instruction. This is a tight loop, okay? Not as tight as it, can, as it can possibly be, but this is this way I can actually see it looping a little bit better, okay? So we'll go ahead and just assemble the program, single step through it, just to convince ourselves that the jump instruction, in fact, will control the location where we continue execution. This is a pretty easy one. Link. And GDB. Now when I when I type these commands, you know, I seem to be talking to myself. I was not talking to myself. Who was I talking to? No, I, I, I'm talking to you. Okay? Because I want to keep explaining those commands and keep repeating those so that you guys know how what to do when you are going to assemble, link, and run your programs, okay? All right, so once again, we put a breakpoint at underscore start, okay? So we put a breakpoint right at the very beginning. We single step, and then we single step again. Single step, single step, single step, single step. Um, what does it seem to be doing? It's in a loop, and how do we get out of this loop? We don't, okay? This is a tight loop. There's no condition to get out, okay? Well, remember what I said. This is not the tightest loop you can have in assembly language programming. It is not the tightest loop because this is the tightest loop. You branch back to the very same instruction that you came from. If you were to think about how to do this instruction using the emulator, okay, using logic sim, what do you think it is actually doing? Okay, let's bring let's bring up the logic sim picture, okay, so that you guys can say, okay, let's look at all the components and try to figure out how is this type of instruction implemented. Wouldn't it just be resetting the register that points to this place in memory that? Um, yep, and it has a name. Uh, the uh, the one in which I can't remember specifically off the top of my head. Uh. Okay, well, that's okay. We'll we'll get to that. So so V two and it is the later version, the fifteen. All right. So here is the emulator. I'm going to pull it up a little bit because the you know, people cannot see the bottom part of the screen. There we go. Okay, so the, the register that is responsible to indicate the current point of execution in the program is what? Program counter, which is also known as? PC. PC, okay? The program counter PC is the register that is responsible to remember, oh, the next instruction to execute is at that location, okay? So when you want to alter the path of execution and say, you know what, I don't want to go to the next instruction anymore, I want to go to that part of the program, which register is going to be changed? PC, okay? The program counter is going to be changed. So I'm going to give you a scenario of writing a particular program with certain instructions. Now, we don't have a microcode machine, but I can still emulate it, okay? 
So let's say we are at location 09 at this point, okay? And 09 is a jump instruction. It wants to continue execution at location, I don't know, 23 in hexadecimal, okay? So 23, which is the destination, which is the address where you want to continue execution, is now a part of the instruction itself. Which also means, you know, the current PC has to be what? What do you think is the current PC for me to be at the unconditional branch instruction to go to location 23? No. No, 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 no. This is the byte that is in red that is highlighted is the address that I want to branch to. It is a part of the instruction that I'm currently executing. So PC, which is the program counter, it is always pointing to the instruction that is executing or the next instruction. So where should it be pointing to? The very same place, which is zero, no, zero nine. Zero eight is the actual opcode which we are done decoding already at this point. So it's now pointing to zero nine, which is the address where I want to go. Okay. So because I want to emulate exactly what is going on inside the processor when you run the jump instruction, but we don't have a microcode the you know, engine yet. So I have to kind of hard code it like this. Okay. So the program counter is already pointing at zero nine, and when you are executing this instruction, we need to now somehow make a connection between all of these components, which means I need PC to be driving the. How, how do I want to connect PC to the memory module? The first thing I need to do is what? Connect it to the mux. We need to connect it to the mux, okay? Which mux are we talking about? Because, well, okay, there are two muxes here. Which mux are we talking about? The one in the middle. This one? Okay. And this, the output of this mux goes to the address bus. So you are correct. We want the program counter to drive the address bus so that we can grab the address where we want to branch to, okay? And in order to make the PC, which is this connection, connect to the output of the MUX, how do we set the uh, selection? One, one. It would be one, one in this case, because this is zero, this is one, two, three. Three is one, one in binary. So one, one is correct. Okay, very good. So now we when we check, this is nine, or one, zero, zero, one. This is also nine, which is one, zero, zero, one. We have to select the RAM because we are trying to access RAM, but we are trying to read from RAM and not to overwrite. So the load, uh, the load pin has to be a high. Okay. So when when we when this is all done, the output from RAM is already the content got the content that we want. Zero zero one zero is a two. Zero zero one one is a three. So three two three is now on the data bus. What do we want to do with the data bus now? Remember, we want to continue execution at location 23, which means what do I need to do? I need to change one of the registers to 23, but which one? The program counter itself. Okay? So I'm reading a byte, in this case is a byte, in RAM, and I want to take that byte, take that content, and use it to overwrite the program counter itself so that the next instruction I execute is now going to be at location 23 and not 0A anymore because otherwise it just keeps going. It's using the incrementing mechanism to keep going. Okay, so now that I know I want uh, input one of the mux, okay, let me point out which mux here. I want the input one of this mux to go back to the input of the PC, so that means I need to do what? Whatever you do with a mux, you have to deal with the selection and we have to turn this select pin to, to a one. Very good, okay, so we turn this to a one and then we can double check first, okay? We double check, this is uh, two three in hexadecimal or 35 in decimal. We check the output of the mux, same thing, very good. So now the PC has the correct input, what do I need to do to update it? Clock. Two things, there are two things to do. The first thing is to enable it, and then the second thing is to clock it, yep. So we raise the clock and drop it down. And the PC has a fallen edge sensitivity because of the way, the reason why I make the PC sensitive to a fallen edge 
is to improve the efficiency of the processor. But it is, you know, it is updated on the falling edge. Okay, so you can see that the PC now has two three. So I am now continuing execution at location two three in hexadecimal. I don't really have any actual instruction. I don't have a microcode engine to execute instruction, but that is the internal mechanism of a unconditional branch instruction. Is that okay? Because normally what happens is, you know, for each clock cycle, it is only going to take the output of the adder, which is adding one every single time, and put it back into the program counter. So it will just keep incrementing, going to the next instruction, the next instruction, the next instruction. But by going through what I just did, now I can alter the path of execution. I can say, hey, don't just go to the next instruction. I want you to continue execution at a specific place. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so this is the underlying mechanism of a jump instruction. And this will continue here. The next slide is a long one because it talks about conditional branch instructions. Conditional branch instruction can be conditional to a whole bunch of stuff. So we'll talk about the basic stuff first, and then we'll talk about the kind of the combination stuff. JC means jump if and only if the carry flag is set. In other words, okay, let's go ahead and write a very simple program to illustrate this. In fact, we'll write two programs to illustrate this. This is our unconditional branch instruction. I don't, need, I don't think we need that anymore. So we'll go to, we'll take a look at the JC instruction. Uh, global underscore start underscore start. Okay. The first thing you need to do with a J to test a JC or jump, even only if carry is set instruction, is to either clear or set the carry flag. But you have to do it intentionally. So this way you can test the result of the, the conditional branch, okay? So we'll go ahead and clear the carry flag. Can someone tell me a simple way to clear the carry flag without using immediate operands, without using constants? How do you clear the carry flag? I want to, I want to do some sort of calculation that will guarantee that the carry flag is clear. Yep. At zero, but that involves constants. Zero is a constant. You can move the value of one register to another. Good suggestion, but it won't do it. Because move instructions do not affect flags at all. In other words, they retain the, the current values of the flags. It doesn't matter, you know, it, it just won't change it. Okay? Yeah. Compare? Yeah. Compare? Compare. Very good. Okay, what are we comparing? We don't want to subtract from this from a register because that will in fact change the register. But you got the idea. So you guys both got a piece of the answer. We compare a register to itself, which is basically a subtraction, except it doesn't store the result. But it will clear the carry flag because when you subtract a value from itself, what do you get? You get a flat, you get a zero. But at the same time, there's no borrow because they are the same value. There's no need to borrow. Okay, so that will do it. So to clear the carry flag, you can just say, okay, subtract long. Doesn't even have to subtract long. You can say subtract byte, okay? BL from BL. Just pick, you know, a particular A bit register and, sub and compare it. Okay? I said compare before, okay, and compare it to itself. That will change the flags without changing the A bit register. But this will clear the carry flag. So what I want to do is to find out, okay, if the jump carry, if the JC instruction is continuing execution at, I don't know, we'll just say L1, we'll define L1 down here. We'll put some no up here, just so that we can see whether it branches or not, okay? So in this case, we should skip the, the no op instruction here and continue with the no op instruction here. Is that making any sense? Because JC is saying branch to the label, branch to L1 in this case, if and only if the carrier flag is set. What if it is cleared? What do you think a JC, what, what do you think a conditional branch instruction will do when the condition is false? 
you could not jump, and not jumping means by falling through with the next one. Falling through, which means we just continue with whatever is next to this instruction. Okay? So we can test this now. There's nothing of instruction here to test it. Because the prediction, okay, let me turn on the line numbers. So the prediction is if we start with line three, we go to line four. After line four, because the carrier flag is cleared for sure, we will continue execution at not line four. Yes, we will continue execution on line five because we are not jumping to L1. Okay. Very good. Let's go ahead and test it. So we assemble. Link. Remember, I'm not talking to myself. Or at least that's what you want us to think. Put a breakpoint at underscore start of the program. Single step. First thing first, okay? It, we really should be checking you know, all the flags to make sure that. What about the Z flag? Should the Z flag be set or cleared? Should be set because the result of subtracting BL from BL should be a zero, okay? Even though we don't store the result, you know, it, it would still be a zero after the subtraction. Uh, what about the carry flag? Should be cleared. What about the sign flag? That's a trick question. If the Z flag is set, what do you know about the, the sign flag? Has to be cleared because the sign flag is a part of the result. If the result is zero, the sign flag has to be a zero. There's no negative zero. Okay. What about the overflow flag? Should be set or cleared? be clear because subtracting a value from itself getting a zero makes perfect sense. Okay. So the sign makes sense. Alright, so we'll double check that. I R E flags. And in fact we only have the zero flag turned on, all the other ones are off. Okay, exactly the way we expected. Now when we single step the JC instruction, it should not branch to L1. It should just continue on line five, right? Single step. Line five. So we have now, you know, a you know, demonstration. It's not a validation. It's just a demonstration of how a conditional branch instruction works in one case. So in the so I'm going to change the program a little bit. Intentionally set the carry flag, and then see if it will go to the other location. Okay. Let's see about this. All right, so how can I do that? I probably cannot do this without destroying one of the registers. So let's just say that we can, in fact, destroy one of the registers. Yep. Oh, okay. So how would you do this? How can you set the carry flag, which is also known as the borrow flag? If you add one to one, it becomes two, and that one will give you a carry. Yeah, uh, Subtracting a one from a zero should do it. Okay, so what we'll do is we turn this into an actual subtraction instruction. So that will make BL a zero. And then we'll proceed to compare a one to zero. We are, we are basically subtracting a one from a zero in the compare instruction. In fact, this has to be a compare byte instruction. There we go. Okay. Are there any questions about lines three and four? Line three is going to turn BL into a zero because I'm subtracting the, the register from itself, storing the result into BL. If BL is guaranteed to be a zero, then line four is going to subtract one from zero but not store the result of negative one into BL. But it will still go through the same, you know, bitwise operations, you know, as a subtraction. Which means it's gonna set the borrow flag. Hmm? It will clear the zero flag, set the borrow flag, which is the carry flag. What about the sign flag? Is it gonna be set or cleared? 
Zero minus one is negative one. Negative one is a negative number, which means the sign flag is going to be set, okay? What about the overflow flag? Can we represent negative one using 32 bits? No, okay, so the overflow flag is going to be cleared. Okay. All right, so let's write all that stuff down here just so that we know the result of the comparison. Okay. So we know that BL should still be zero because we are not storing the result of the second subtraction. We know that the Z flag is going to be a zero because it is negative one, which is non-zero. The borrow flag, which is also known as the carry flag, is going to be a one. The sign flag is also going to be a one because the result is negative. And then the overflow flag is going to be clear because we do have enough bits to represent negative one. So we should not be expecting any problems as far as the sign is concerned. So these are the expected results, which means by the time we get to line 10, the JC instruction should actually continue execution at label L1. So we should end up on line 15 in the debugger. Is that okay? And this is how I want you guys to study is when you encounter an instruction and I describe it very vaguely in my description, in my text, okay? So what do you do to make sure that you are understanding the instruction correctly? You run small experiments, okay? Five line, three line experiments, okay? Doesn't have to be long. You just have to design the experiment, expect a particular result from the experiment, run it, and validate that your understanding, your prediction is correct. What if your prediction is wrong? It's actually a good thing, because now you get to learn something. And not at the expense of points in the exam either. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and test out this program and see whether it does what we think it should be doing. Uh, we can just reassemble, relink, and then we GDB. Uh, this is a uh, command line shortcut. When you use the exclamation point on the command line, you're telling Bash, which is the shell program here, you're telling Bash to repeat the previous command that starts with these two letters in this case. Okay? You can give it only one letter. One letter is fine because we AS starts with A, LD starts with L, and GDB starts with G. They do not have any collision. They're not started with the same letter. Okay? So it's a really useful shorthand if you really need to do this quickly. Uh, once again, we put a breakpoint at underscore start, run the program, single step, and then we single step. Well, let's check first, okay? Tell me what is in BL. BL is a zero, as expected. Single step the compare instruction this time. Check out BL. BL has not changed because it is a compare instruction, not a subtract instruction. Then we want to check out all the flags. We see the carry flag, we see the sign flag, we do not see the Z flag, nor the overflow flag, those are clear. Okay, so everything is as expected. Now we are gonna single step the JC instruction. I said that because the carry flag is in fact set here, we now should continue execution at L1, which is line, what, 11, something like that? I think I have changed the listing of the program, so let's double check. Okay, so it will, be, it will be line 15 this time. So single step one more time, and it did go to line 15 because of the conditional branch instruction. Are there any questions about the behavior of a conditional branch instruction? You guys remember how I you know, want to use pseudo C notation in this class? Let me show you what the, the pseudo C notation of a JC instruction. So if you have a JC instruction to L1, it's kind of the same thing. You can actually say it's approximately the same thing because it's not exactly the same, but it's close. It is basically saying if C is non-zero, go to L1, that's it. Because this is a conditional statement in C that has no else. Well, a conditional statement in C that has no else means if the condition is false, what do you do? Yep, you just continue with whatever is next to it, which is the same behavior as a JC instruction. There's also a JNC instruction. What do you think a JNC instruction do? What do you think that N stands for? You 
can say negate, you can say not, okay, same thing, okay? So J and C is jump if not carry to L1, which means it's equivalent to if not C, okay, if C is zero, go to GOTO L1. Same thing. Are we doing okay so far at this point? Are you guys starting to see how we compare numbers and control the flow of the program depending on comparison in assembly? Because now we have all the pieces. You know, I, I don't want, I don't need you guys to be working on programs with control structure just yet. But can you see how these pieces can connect so that we can, we can do something complex now, okay? We can now say if x is greater than y, we put, oops, I keep using pseudocode in the wrong class, z gets x, else z gets y. Can you see how to group the instructions that we have talked about up to this point to do this? Okay, well, what is x, y, and z? We don't know how to do with variables, fine. Look at x as eax, look at y as ebx, look at z as ecx. So if you replace all the variables with registers, do we have enough instructions to implement this conditional statement? Yes, we do, okay? And we do have three minutes left, and I think that's enough time to work on this one, okay? Okay, first of all, what do we need to do? We don't want to deal with this or this first, okay? So remember X is EAX, Y is EBX, and Z is ECX. So what do we need to do first with a conditional statement? So we have to compare. Sorry? <coughs> we, we have to compare, very good. We start with the compare. So we say compare long, and what I usually do is I put the right-hand side of the comparison as the first operand, okay? So this is EBX. And the first op and the one to the left hand side is my second operand, which is E A X. Okay. The compare instruction itself does not dictate which way to go. It simply sets up all the flags. That's all it does. Okay? So now the question is which flag am I going to use in order to continue execution somewhere? Now this is where it is a little bit counterintuitive, okay? Because we normally would look at this and go like, we want to confirm x is greater than y, then we continue with this code here. You can do it that way, but your program will be slightly longer than it is necessary. So what we normally do is we go the other way around. We check whether x is less than or equal to y, then we branch to the else branch. Because then we will fall through automatically to the then branch. Okay? All right. So how do we know that x is less than y? Because that's one reason to go to the else branch. Well, you cannot answer that question because I haven't given you a piece of information. What did I, what have I not told you so that you can determine what flag to use or what flag to pay attention to? Whether those numbers are signed or not. Okay, you got the right concept, whether the numbers are signed or not. So let's say they're not signed, they're unsigned numbers, okay? So what, what flags do I use to confirm that the first operand is less than the, does the second operand is less than the first operand? Okay, think about this. If EAX is less than EBX, which flag is gonna be set? We're talking about unsigned interpretation. We just, we, we just work with that flag. Uh, borrow. The borrow flag, which is also known as the carry flag, okay? So we say JC, and I can use else as a label name, okay? That's perfectly okay as a label name, okay? That's one reason, okay? If X is less than Y, that's one reason to go to the else branch, but there's one more reason. Which one is that? Equal. Equal, okay, very good. And we haven't really talked about that instruction. Can someone guess, based on what we have already observed, what is the conditional branch that says, if they're the same, go to J, Z. Very good, because these are just the names of the flags, okay? So the four flags that we have talked about, they, we can use it as a letter in the conditional branch instruction. So J, Z, also to else, because if these two numbers are the same, I still want to end up with the else branch, okay? 
oh, what if I fall through both of these instructions? What does it mean? It means x is not less than y. It means x does not equal to y, which only means that x is greater than y. So now I can implement this. Okay. Do we know how to copy register A to register C? We haven't really looked at that particular combination, but from what we have discussed up to this point, can someone guess how to do that? Okay, move along. What is our first operand? That's our source. Percent DAX. This is where we are copying from. The second operand is our destination. It's going to be ECX. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, okay, so let me put uh, else as a label here. What do we do at else? Another move long instruction, right? Move long, EBX this time, e EBX to ECX. Okay, very good. Do you see I leave, I left a gap here? What do you, what do you think needs to go here? If I don't put anything here, what's going to happen after the move out instruction? It's going to go on ahead. It will continue with the other move out instruction, which is not what we want. So you have to put a jump. We have to put an unconditional branch here to the end if label here. So now we have all the necessary ingredients to deal with control structure. Now, you don't have to worry if you're looking at this and go like, wow, that's a big jump from what we have just talked about. That's okay, because the next few slides will actually talk about it. Let me go back to Moodle first, and I can show you what you can be reading you know, to, pre to, pre like, to prepare for the next class. See, I told you my speech center is kind of a little bit messy today. I don't know why. It's just one of those days. Mm -hmm. Someone is interfering with me. Okay, so that part is in assembly language programming, and this is called control structure. And there's a newer portion and a new older version. Let me see. If they, yep, it's in here. I just want to double check they're both clickable. Yep, they're both clickable. So they are already here. Okay, and I will give you. Okay, I know we are over by two minutes. What this really is about, okay, after reading this, it will turn you into a human compiler, into an organic compiler. Okay, organic. Yeah, organic, human, whatever. Or as the Ferengi say, human. So, but the, the point is, it's a very mechanical process, okay? This is a very, very mechanical process. I'll give you a control structure in C on one side. I'll give you the equivalent code in assembly on the other side. Okay? And it's very mechanical. You just have to apply it in a structured way, and then you will be able to turn any control structure in C and C++ into assembly code, stuff that we have just talked about. Okay? And that's, that's, the, that's the how and the what. Why are we doing this? How is this going to help you in the future? Portability. Okay. Portability, and I like your answers too. What was it again? To hack, okay? To hack. Because when you get an executable, it is all in binary code, okay? Turning binary code into assembly instruction is no big deal, okay? GDB can do it, all kinds of debugging can do it. But when you look at a whole bunch of instructions, what do you what, what do you get out of it? Well, if you know how to structure your control structure, you can reverse it. You can decompile programs. Which means, looking at the assembly code, you can figure out the high level logic of a program. You can turn, you can basically reverse the whole process. And why do you want to do that? Let's say you work for a computer information security company, okay? And some a particular computer is hacked and because it's because of an attachment from one of the email messages is an executable what are you going to do you disassemble it 
Okay, you go through a particular debug program, you disassemble the code, you analyze the code by reversing what you're going to learn here. Then you figure out the logic of the virus or whatever payload it is. Then you can figure out how it works. Once you know, or once you figure out how it works, then you know how to counter it. You can learn things about it because it might be a very special technique that was also used in another virus in the database. Okay, so you can start to do things about it. And why do you think information security is something that I, that I keep mentioning over and over again? It pays good for one thing, and two, but well, being a C being CEO of Microsoft pays good too. <laughs> for a couple of years. Work, I like that answer. Yep. For a couple of years. Well, it's a growing field. Okay, I do not see information security a, as a declining field in a, any time soon. Yep. It's an everlasting field. Oh, it keep evolving. It keep changing. It's going to be a very challenging field. Yep. I was talking about being CEO of Microsoft. Oh, CEO uh, of Microsoft. It's good for a couple of years. Unless Microsoft. Then you get fired. But that's all you need. A couple of years is all you need. Then you can go enjoy a basketball game like uh, Mr. Balma. Just look it up. You know there are video, uh, there are YouTube clips of him watching a basketball game, and you know let's just say that he's he doesn't act like a normal basketball uh, fan. It's an old hmm? it's an older yeah. Well. Cares. Well, that's the end of today's lecture. Um, I know most of you will go check out um, Steve Balma and basketball game on YouTube. But don't forget your homework assignment after you watch the video.